vlog September 17th. I would have thrown Elise off the train if Kaleem and I hadn't done some moon scrying that suggested an unexpected and determined ally would join me in battle. Hmm. She was unexpected and unwanted. And she would not stop talking, even though I was trying to go over my spells to battle the coven. She told me she's been listening to my recordings from the summer. She's been trying to find me for weeks. Girl, what? I can't believe it turned out to be this easy. This is faded. (laughs) She said the phrase, black woman, so often that I found myself checking to see if she was a really, really, really light-skinned sister herself. Nope. I know that everybody has some African DNA in them since we're all from Africa, but if there's more than 0.00001% African DNA in at least, I'd be shocked. She's an ally with a capital A. Mm. Brooke and Carmen tortured me in high school. No matter what I did, I wasn't accepted. When they did that spell and left me stuck in those high school memories, it was just the worst. I felt sorry for her, for a second. I want to help you fight them. It shouldn't be up to black women to save us. You all have done so much already. These witch bitches, as you called them, need to be stopped. I want to help you. Let's put my privilege to good use. Do you know any magic? Because I don't think you can use white privilege in a fight with witches who also have white privilege. Most of them, anyway. She fell into a silence for the last 15 minutes of the train ride and the cab ride to Victor's house, which she insisted on paying for. I'm still coming to terms with my own magical powers, with being a witch bitch myself. The New York skeptic in me thinks I'm in a mental hospital somewhere, drooling on myself as Victor comes to visit me with his new wife, Carmen. Elise would be another patient. Realm presents, If I Go Missing, The Witches Did It, Episode 9. Victor was standing on the porch, smiling with his hand over his heart when we arrived. It's the same look he gets when we watch E.T., and E.T. and Elliot are saying goodbye, and they each say, Ouch. Or when we're watching Shawshank Redemption and Morgan Freeman's character finds Tim Robbins' character on the beach in Mexico and they hug. Just before Victor took me in his arms and kissed me, he said, Mmm, I'm so glad you're back, babe. If you ever feel like running away again, wake me up so we can run away together. It was a good kiss, I'm not gonna lie. I almost forgot Elise was there until she cleared her throat. Oh, Elise. I didn't see you there. When he said that, Elise got so pale I thought she was going to disappear. I've got something for you. It was a temporary tattoo with his birth chart. Of course it was enchanted with a protection spell that Kaleem had promised me couldn't be broken by the witch bitches. Not unless they have access to and can translate spells in Sanskrit from 1588 BC. I don't know what they had access to. Brooke did have the top of an Egyptian sarcophagus in her bedroom. Whatever. I couldn't worry about it. Victor and I are stronger together, except when it comes to fighting witches. I knew he was going to be a point of vulnerability for me, and that was eliminated when I applied the tattoo. Victor pretended to love it. Hey, babe. Elise reached out and touched it. She pulled back her hand like she'd been zapped by a current. I didn't know if Kaleem and I had made the spell too strong or if Victor just needed protection from Elise. I decided to keep an eye on my unexpected ally in battle. I excused myself for a couple of minutes to put Great Uncle Felix's money back in the grandfather clock, minus a few hundred dollars I needed to live. I looked at the time when I was finished and the coven was gonna be here soon. I had DM'd each of them to meet me at the planetary hour Kaleem calculated to be best for the spell work I was planning to do against them. 
I slipped a sleeping pill into Victor's drink, and it wasn't long before he was passed out on the couch. Elise was hemming and hawing over the ethics of that. I had debated it too, but I couldn't risk him being out there. Not only would his worldview be shook, but he could actually get hurt in the magical crossfire. You can stay back here and watch over him if you want. They'll be here soon. Elise looked Victor over and kissed him on the cheek, even though she knew it would sting. (sighs) If I hadn't been there, she probably would have kissed him on the mouth. She says she knows Victor from high school. Mm Mm-hmm. They must not have been close at all, because anybody who really knows Victor knows he hasn't had a white girlfriend since sophomore year of high school. She had no chance, even if I was out of the picture. Uh, I can't protect you. I'm here to support you, Jenna. She thought about it for a minute, shook her head, and then she thrust her chest forward as if she was ginning up some courage through body movement. Mm. What's your sign, Elise? Pisces. <laughs> I grabbed a magic marker from the kitchen and drew the symbol for Pisces on her arm with the words, I believe, underneath the marking. That's the motto of the Pisces. I charged the sign with a blessing. It was the least I could do if she was going to follow me blindly out to the fight. I hear the coven's cars pulling up. I've got to go. Brooke, Carmen, Mommy Megan, and BB are wearing black tunic dresses and braided gold belts as they face off against me and Jenna in the land behind Great Uncle Felix's house. I stand with my right side slightly forward because Jenna drew that wonderful tattoo on my forearm and I wanted the coven to really get a full visual on that. I feel like I'm with Wyatt Earp at the OK Corral. Does that make me Doc Holliday? I do wish Jenna and I had coordinated outfits. There's got to be some power in it, like how bridesmaids' dresses at a wedding give more power to the bride by emphasizing her white dress. Something like that. Brooke speaks first. Is that a weak move? Or is it a show of strength? Oh gosh, I wish I knew more military history. I should have watched those Civil War movies with my father like he'd asked. I knew you were going to be trouble the minute we first met you. Apparently, she quote-unquote read it. I don't know if all witches are psychics, but each witch here seems to be. So interesting. (laughs) Burke goes on to say that they tried being nice to Jenna at first, thinking that with the right direction, she could even become a member of their coven. (laughs) I was incredulous. You call your behavior toward Jenna nice? This is your backup? Carmen asks Jenna, mildly gesturing to me. Even now, as she's showing disdain for me, Carmen is stunning. Bibi says in a low smoker's voice, I told you all we shouldn't have come here. I wonder what she means. Brooke tells her that they had no choice. Jenna has crossed a line in messing with their businesses. They had no choice but to do away with her, no matter where they had to do it. Meanwhile, Jenna hasn't said a word. Her body is tense, the way mine is just before I'm about to hit a ball served by my tennis instructor. Her beautifully wide brown eyes scan the women. Is she reading them? Or is she casting a spell already? Her lips aren't moving though. Maybe she's reserving her power. We can't let you tell the world about us, Jenna. And we can't let you continue to screw with our income. I told you what was at stake, Mommy Megan says, stepping forward and moving her arms in a way that suggests she's grooming a big ball of energy that I can't see. I wonder if the others can see what Megan's ball of energy looks like. Is it golden, green, red? Whatever it is, she throws it in Jenna's direction, which Jenna apparently blocks by bending a moonbeam with what looks like an antique silver hand mirror. It's interesting. I can see some of Jenna's magical energy. Maybe because of the marking she made on my arm? It it burns a little. I imagine that's because it's protecting me from Megan's blow. Not waiting for the other witches to strike, Jenna pulls down the energy of the moon. 
To me, it looks like she's pulled the moon out of the sky and hit the coven with it. For the first time ever, the smirk is wiped off of Brooke's face. I'm fairly certain I see fear there. She pretends otherwise. Kid gloves off. All of the coven starts throwing their energy while Jenna is making missiles out of stars. Some of the coven's magic is emotional manipulation, fear and despair. I know this because I can feel it. Not as much as I would without Jenna's protection, I think, but I can feel some of it. I can tell Jenna is feeling it too because I see a few tears leaking out of her eyes. I have to give her some reprieve. If you ever want to get a reservation at a decent restaurant in this city again, I suggest you back up. Even as I'm saying it, I'm questioning it, but it seems to make Baby hesitate a little bit. So, I keep going. If any of you ever want to step foot in the Colony Club, turn around right now and leave Jenna alone. Otherwise, one call to my grandmother and you won't even be admitted as a guest. Phoebe puts her hands down, about to retreat, when Jenna hits them all with a gigantic wave of energy from Mars. It's blood red. I only know it's Martian energy because Jenna said something about the warrior planet, and Mars is the Roman god of war. Enough! Brooke yells, her eyes turning as black as her tunic. Jenna looks at me and tells me to run. I, I, I would if I could, I'm frozen. Carmen's eyes turn black, and Mommy Megan's too, like it's some kind of contagious disease. Baby's eyes begin to change, and then revert back to form. She backs up, and before she follows through on her retreat, she looks at me and says, Give your father my regards. I look over to Jenna. She's on her knees. Whatever the remaining trio is doing is taking its toll on her. I start hurling threats. That product of yours will never be featured in another fashion magazine by the time Sabine is done with you. Brooke, you'll never get that Vogue cover no matter how much you masturbate. Sabine has a direct line to Anna Wintour. I mean, I hate name dropping, but it has to be done. I don't have anything to threaten Mommy Megan with, but I'm fairly certain that if the other two fall, she couldn't take on Jenna by herself. Shut up before I rip out your tongue, Brooke says to me, and I begin to feel my throat closing up. Ancestors, I call upon you! And that makes Carmen gasp. I get goosebumps. A figure comes out of the woods. A specter with a beautiful aura of white light around her. She looks just like Jenna. Oh my god. Colonial Jenna is real. Brooke, Carmen, and Megan are dragged backwards against their will. Their shoes dig tracks in the ground. Colonial Jenna extends a hand to my Jenna. Uh, no, uh, modern Jenna. I start crying with joy as modern Jenna stands. Oh, this is all so lovely. I feel overwhelmed. Together. The Jennas bring Brooke, Carmen, and Megan to their knees. I want you to know that I would never let any true harm come to you. I waited a long time for you to come. I was chased by townsfolk for being a witch. They wanted to hang me. I ran to Richardson Land looking for help. My predators caught me before I could find a Richardson. The townsfolk hung me back there on the oak. A Richardson found me and cut me down. I used my last breath to bless them in their land with a union of our lines. I am ugly crying at this point. Everyone just looks like a big blur. Does this mean Jenna is pregnant? Oh, I'm sure Victor would be thrilled. He gets a baby with the woman he loves while fulfilling his family's destiny. Hell of a day for a man who's sleeping on the couch. <laughs> what do I get? What shall be their fate? Colonial Jenna asks, waving her hand in front of Brooke, Carmen, and Mommy Megan. It was witches like them who betrayed me to the townsfolk. 
Modern Jenna whispers to Colonial Jenna, who glances in my direction. Oh no, what's wrong? What could I have done? Goodbye, cruel world. Everything fades to black. Log, March 6th. I read in the news that they were canceling South by Southwest because of the coronavirus. First time in the festival's 34-year history that it's been canceled. It was the right thing to do. But I feel sad at the same time. I'm supposed to be on a panel talking about my soon-to-be-published book, The Woman, The Witch, and The Capitalist. It's my first piece of quote-unquote fiction. When Colonial Jenna asked me what we should do to Brooke, Carmen, and Mommy Megan, part of me wanted them to lose everything. They had really put me through it, and I was sure that if Colonial Jenna hadn't come through, those witch bitches would have made sure I was destroyed on every level. Who knows, they might have done worse. But one thing has stuck out to me in Colonial Jenna's story. She said it was her fellow witches who had outed her. I was planning to do the same to the influencer coven. Hmm. I figured we could call it even. Colonial Jenna liked that. Together, we did a spell to edit the memories of everyone directly and indirectly involved. Even people tangentially involved, like Divine and her clerk of the 13th house, thought they were meeting me for the first time when we saw each other later that year. Bibi officially left the coven, even selling her house in Bedford. I guess she decided to operate the old-fashioned way, making deals on golf courses and clubhouses. Her company even made a bid to publish my book. My agent was excited. I took it as an apology. Her departure from the coven forced the remaining three to really focus on their prosperity magic. They didn't have the power to do any bitchy side magic, and I don't know that they wanted to anymore. Both Carmen and Megan sent me congratulatory notes about my book. When I finally got the nerve to look at their feeds again, I saw that there were no more pictures of them post-sex magic orgasms around Carmen's fire pits. Victor thought we had a very high and drunken summer, so much so that he decided to abstain from both when we went back to Greenpoint in the late fall. I wonder sometimes if there's a small part of him that remembers that I went missing. He holds my hand a lot more, and we don't fight as much. He's changed, much more thoughtful. But then that might be because I've changed. Turns out, being a naturally powerful celestial witch really boosts your self-confidence. The night of the fight, I didn't have time enough to get Elise back to the city, so I took her to Fell's restaurant and set her up with a bunch of tapas and a half bottle of wine. She wasn't quite sure how she got to the restaurant, but she was sure that she was in town looking for gossip. Last I heard, she and Fel were dating on and off. It made me a little disappointed in Fel to hear that, but I guess her pedigree mattered more than her personality. I decided to change that as well. Well, tweak it. I asked Colleen to help me come up with a spell to make Elise be the amazing anti-racist super feminist ally she thinks she is. At least she wants to be. Speaking of Kaleem, he was happy when I told him what Colonial Jenna said about me and Victor's lines crossing. You see, like I told you, he's the earth to your sky. He said, handing me Victor's chopped cheese and my coffee. I still haven't told Kaleem that I used prosperity magic to help me write and sell my book. The same thing I had given the influencer coven shit for. I barely acknowledge it to myself. But now I feel like the whole world is paying for my desperate magic. I think I threw everything out of balance and left us all open to this global pandemic. I tell myself to fuck off because that sounds really self-centered. But I was manipulating a lot of energy and that has consequences. There's a flow to the magical energy throughout the universe. Yes, magical energy. All energy is magical energy if you ask me. When we fuck around with it, taking shortcuts that aren't the right shortcuts for us, we throw the flow off course. Lots of little throws can cause catastrophe. 
What if I was the throw that broke the world's back? That thought keeps me up at night. Of course, I'm doing every spell I can think of to set the magical energy right. I haven't succeeded yet. I can't help but wonder if it's all the stress and bad juju that's floating through the air. I have wondered if the world is shutting down because on some level, I'm scared to succeed. Your energy is written into every spell. You need to be 100% clean when you cast. Subconscious intentions can bring down the world's most powerful witches. Kaleem argues with me about this, but I think everyone is a witch on some level. Nothing gets made without an intention. We don't go anywhere or do anything without an intention. We're creating our lives every day. Kaleem says I think that because I'm a natural born celestial witch. Regular people have access to magic. Women like the ones in the coven you encountered can take that basic magic and experiment with it and practice crafting spells to grow power. Mind you, they still need a coven to amplify their power. Only hereditary witches like you can wield it on a worldwide scale alone. I don't know. Maybe he's right. I wonder if another witch or coven of witches is wielding their power right now. Somebody always profits from disaster. Prosperity witches. Damn. You're listening to If I Go Missing, The Witches Did It. Starring Gabory Sidibe. Created and produced by Realm. Your portal to another world. Listen away. If I Go Missing, The Witches Did It is executive produced by and stars Gabory Sidibe. Written by Pia Wilson and produced by Rhoda Bayessa and Haley Wagreich. Associate produced by Michael Coulter and executive produced by Molly Barton. Performed by Gabory Sidibe, Sarah Natacheni, Aaron Landon, Lena Klingeman, Tony D, Alba Ponce de Leon, Tiana Camacho, Jordan Belsky, Eli Gonzalez, and Andrew Lee. Directed by Kaylin West and Amanda Rose Smith. Sound design by Fred Greenhalge and Carter Wogan of Dagaz Media. Audio engineered by Corey Barton. Original theme music by Hashem Asadolahi. Cover art by Kendall Thomas with original illustration by Rochelle Baker. <laughs>